Please rise for his honor, the Lieutenant Governor of British Columbia. I'd like to uh, ask Chief Douglas White to offer a traditional welcome. Asiem nesiaya, ainte pekwal asultin tanis na nemo, ait na shkwalu an konas iich i hait sevka hait sevka siam estimo. Dear honored guests, Lieutenant Governor, National Chief. Grand Chiefs, Chiefs, Guests. Uh, my name is Chief Douglas White. I'm the Chief of the Stanemo First Nation, and I've got such a good feeling in my heart standing here on this morning of this uh, day, the opening day of the conference, to be able to welcome you here. It's a real honor. One of the, um, one of the great honors that can be bestowed in Coast Salish culture that I'm aware of is to respond to an invitation to come, to, to be part of work, to be part of important events, and to be a part of the life of families in our communities. The fact that you've responded favorably to our invitation is a really great honor for all of us that are here. And the Stanemo, uh, we have the honor of co-hosting this conference with Vancouver Island University. And as co-host to the conference and uh, host to all of you that have gathered in Stanemo territory, I want to extend the deepest welcome to you all. I have, uh, as I said in my own language and in English, I have such a good feeling in my heart to be here today to be gathered up for this conference to be talking about such important issues. And I really welcome all of you with the deepest respect, um, all of the chiefs of the, the nations, the leaders from across the country, um, academics and, and citizens of the region, uh, politicians of, of the province that are all here uh, gathered in, the, in, in what I hope is a similar spirit and that you all have a, a similar feeling in your hearts. It's certainly uh, the way that we um, are here and gathered uh, to embrace you all in an important conversation and dialogue about one of the really important public policy matters of our country. 
So with that, I welcome you all to, uh, to Slendemok territory. Thank you. If I could ask Chief George Hunt Sr. to lead us in an opening prayer. Thank you. Hela tolita hamasag, kanchawa kalgida. Akela kasla ikaki kame kaki gano kapiya kwanala kahila lisa sno nala kano sasum chuchukuma hailo kone tuwa isma maya lida. A mumuka kahiti le sanakwa, akela kasla. Umkela kaso nanaibo kaki axila gakano. Amen. <clears throat> well, welcome everyone on behalf of uh, Vancouver Island University and Snanemo First Nation to this uh, most unique and most wonderful gathering to explore and talk and learn together about the pre-Confederation treaties of Vancouver Island. Um, if you look around you and we reflect for a minute, um, you'll see that this is quite a unique gathering on this island because in this room right now, I would suggest that we have more experience and knowledge and wisdom and understanding of these treaties than has ever been gathered in one place before. We have with us the, the leaders and representatives and elders of the 12 uh, nations who are partners uh, in these treaties. Uh, Chief Russell Chips and the Beecher Bay First Nation, Chief Andy Thomas and the Esquimalt First Nation, Chief Rupert Wilson, the Quaguth, Chief David Harry of Malahat, Chief David Bob of Snanawas, Chief Bruce Underwood of Pakwachin, Chief Robert Sam of Songhees, Acting Chief Gordon Elliott of Sartlip, Chief Harvey Underwood of Sayout, Chief Tanya Jones of Sacum, Chief Gordon Plains of Souk, and Chief Douglas White of Snanemo. We also have gathered here uh, scholars and lawyers who have spent their lives studying these treaties, seeking to understand them, seeking to enlighten some of their meanings and complexities. We have representatives of various levels of the Crown, the other partners in these historic and important agreements. We have representatives of the public, the citizens from the territories up and down the middle and southern part of the island who are inheritors of these treaties that frame our lives within these areas. So really gathered here today is a unique coming together of understanding and wisdom and knowledge and experience about the topic we want to explore together. Over the course of the next two days, we're going to look at these treaties from a range of perspectives. We're going to hear some of the stories and knowledge passed down about them. We're going to hear what the courts have said about them. We're going to hear what scholars have understood and learned. We're going to listen and hear to the challenges of implementing them, both how they have been honored and how they have not. And we're going to hear about the space that these treaties create for indigenous laws to take their place on the land, what they mean for the decision making and jurisdiction for all of the actors in the region and how they must guide and shape uh, how everyone in these regions work together. Um, it's, in envisioning the conference, it's a, certainly about learning and listening and sharing and talking, but it's also a, an opportunity to explore where we go from here together, to chart new pathways of understanding. Uh, treaty. Treaties ultimately are expressions of human relationships. They are expressions of diverse peoples coming together and confirming and sharing and respecting what is different about them and articulating what is shared in common. 
And that's a vital challenge in all human relationships, and it's a vital challenge in relation to these treaties. This morning, we have a number of opening remarks from our distinguished guests who are going to share their vision of what we are here to do over the next few days. And I'd like first to call on Dr. Ralph Nielsen, the President and Vice, Chan Vice Chancellor of Vancouver Island University. Dr. Nielsen has been a visionary in uh, articulating and building how academic institutions in First Nations work together, integrate together, and learn and foster new understandings together. And we're so thankful for his uh, leadership in co-hosting this conference. Dr. Nielsen, please. Thank you very much, Rashan. I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the Sinemuk people, and uh, this institution, 75 years old, has had 75 years of working together with the Sinemuk people, and it's through that partnership that we've been able to develop and evolve as an institution and really grow to be able to serve and support all the people in this community, and we look forward to many more years of that. So thank you to the Sinemuk for the support that they provided over these so many years. It's a very important and supportive relationship. I'd like to also acknowledge the, and welcome the Honorable Lieutenant Governor Stephen Point, um, Chancellor Atlio, our National Chief, but our Chancellor, your home, we appreciate you always when you come home. Chief White, Chief uh, Raybould Smith, Jody, very good to see you again. Last time I remember you up on stage here talking to a, a group of new students, and we always appreciate when you come and share with us. To all the other chiefs uh, and leaders in the, in the crowd, uh, the elders, We've got a number of distinguished panelists. We have a number of our provincial politicians, our municipal politicians. Just appreciate everybody and welcome everybody here to Vancouver Island University for what I hope are some very interesting dialogues and some opportunities to learn and for us to understand. And I, before I start and, and say a few more words, I just want to express again my appreciation to the Sinemic First Nation for the partnership that's led to the creation of this, this conversation and this dialogue. The role and responsibility of a university in any community is to be a place of dialogue. And especially when we have issues and challenges within a community, a university should be a place where we come together in respect, come together to have dialogues about issues that we want to learn more about and be able to learn together. So that's what we're doing here at Vancouver Island University, providing a place for us to get together in dialogue. And VIU has done that over many years, but it's committed to the communities that we serve. And it's committed to be responsive, to be responsible, and to ensure that we're relevant and innovative in serving the communities. This is one more opportunity for us to work in partnership with all the communities that are in this area, in this region, and to uh, establish this partnership. We started this whole conversation with three different conversations, going back to a lecture that was supported by the Governor General, uh, supported by the Royal Society of Canada, and we had a, had a wonderful conversation that Jim Miller led back in February. And that, the topic of that conversation was we're all treaty people. Then we had the opportunity a little bit later in March for Louise Mandel to come to campus and to talk about some legal history and to help us all understand a little bit more about treaties in this country, and particularly treaties in Vancouver Island. We capped off that trilogy of talks leading up to this conversation uh, with a conversation that led by our, our Chancellor and National Chief Sean Atlio and also Chief White, who expanded on the, the whole topic that we're going to be exploring today uh, downtown in our library, and this was held in April. And it was, the title was Implementing the Sinemuk Treaty of 1854, A Vision for Our Common Future. But again, an opportunity for our community to get engaged in conversations and understand more about what we're going to be talking about today. So all of these lead-up events that we had and this gathering are all very, very important steps in improving our understanding of these pre-Confederation treaties and the relationships and responsibilities in the context of these treaties. 
I'm really looking forward to all these panel discussions and conversations that will take place over the next two days. And I really encourage and welcome everybody to get engaged in these conversations. Ask questions. Raise questions. There's no questions that are unacceptable because this is a place of learning. It's a place of opportunity for developing further understandings. It's a place of dialogue. And we as a university want you to feel comfortable, want you to feel safe in a place where you can raise questions that you may be thinking about but not, have not had an opportunity to articulate. And we welcome you into this community to raise those questions, to listen, to listen again, to try and understand, and your understanding is going to be developed by asking questions. One of the, one of the very interesting things that I found coming to Sinemic territory and becoming president of this institution, I've been able to get to know a number of the elders in the community. When we change to a university, many of you have come into our, our campus and you've seen the signs on our campus. And it's got Vancouver Island University nicely presented there, but along the bottom of it, there's a Sinemic language. And that Sinemic language was developed in, the con in, in, in consultation with our elders, and, and particularly um, Elder White, who is, uh, um, has retired as an elder now. And uh, she um, said, yes, this is the language that we're going to use on the, on the new sign. And when I saw it, I said, well, are we going to put any kind of interpretation there for people like me that don't understand the language? And she said, no, Ralph, we're not going to do that. <laughs> and I said, why aren't we going to do that? And she said, you're a place of learning. You want people to ask questions. If they ask what it means, maybe they'll remember. So in, in that context, the elder has held up the context of what this university is all about. It's a place to ask questions. It's a place to learn. And very important for all of us to take that responsibility in the context of this, this conference. So we're very, very fortunate to have the Honorable Stephen Point with us today. Stephen Point became BC's Lieutenant Governor in October of 2007. He received a Bachelor of Law degree from the University of British Columbia in 1985 at a time when there was very, very few First Nations students attending post-secondary institutions. In 1999, his honor was appointed a provincial court judge. In 2000, he received an honorary doctorate of law degree from the University College of the Fraser Valley. And that same year, he was a recipient of the National Aboriginal Achievement Award. The Lieutenant Governor was elected chief of the Skalke First Nation for 15 years and served as a tribal chair of the Stolo Nation government and was honored as a grand chief by the chiefs of the Stolo Tribal Council. In 2005, he was appointed chief commissioner of the BC Treaty Commission. And we have the pleasure of the Lieutenant Governor and his wife, Gwendolyn, joining us for many significant events at Vancouver Island University in the past. And we're so very, very pleased that he's been able to arrange in his schedule to be with us here today. I know he's a student of these treaties and many others, and so uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to honor the Lieutenant Governor and to welcome you into our, into our house today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to uh, go through the list of distinguished guests. I'll just say chiefs and elders and ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President. Um, I, I don't have anything written on my paper. And <laughs> so, somebody messed up, man. Uh, is Tom Berger here? Not till this evening? Oh, good, then I can talk about him. Uh, <laughs> I've been going to these conferences for a long time, over the past several years, as the president mentioned, I'm a student of these treaties. Um, you might wonder why the left-hand governor of the province of British Columbia might be interested in attending a conference um, like this, because the, primarily the left-hand governor is, is an apolitical institution that, that isn't supposed to be making comments about 
um, the law or policy or whatever government may be involved in. But I've had a hard, hard time sh keeping quiet, that's what I'm... <laughs> <laughs> um, But I, I, I have been doing some research on the early uh, colonial um, invasion and the Aboriginal resistance to the stealing of our lands. And I like to come to these conferences to see what's being said because over the time, over, over history, perspectives don't remain the same. They change. And as new people come in and, and learn about what's gone on, uh, they tend to add, add to the, the entire mix. And it's, it's interesting to see. I know that some people come to the conference. I held a, I held a small conference in Chilliwack one time. Uh, I charged $75 for people to come into a room to listen to the history of treaty making in, in British Columbia. And, and the conference was really aimed at, at new people coming in as counselors on, at a band to sort of give them a bit of orientation as to what's happened. One of the first calls I got was from the Federal Department of Affairs. They wanted to come and listen. <laughs> it's not that they need, <laughs> they need any training or better understanding. They wanted, to, they wanted to see what I was going to say. We got calls from the local lo lawyers. They wanted to come. The room began filling up with people who, uh, had, who I thought had no reason to be there. And I wonder what, what it is, each of you, why are you here? I like that Chinese proverb about, about emptying your cup. Because I think we come to these kinds of gatherings with our own preconceived ideas and biases. And sometimes with the whole litany of study that we've done, everything that we've learned. And sometimes we walk into a room like this with our eyes closed and our heart closed instead of the other way around. Sometimes Aboriginal people come into a room full of pain and anger and frustration and just because we've been lied to so many times just because everything that we expected would happen didn't happen. Just because we've learned not to trust anybody, even sometimes our own leaders. And sometimes we come into conferences like this with our eyes closed and our heart closed just because of the pain that Aboriginal people have been through. But I invite you to really leave outside of the door your identity, your personality, everything that you think you may have learned about treaties. Open your book, open your mind. There's always something to hear and to understand. On the plains, the, the, the treaty Indians there have teepee meetings where the chiefs gather to talk about the treaties. And they leave a nail on one of the posts outside of the, of the teepees, which have a very significant meaning. The teepee itself has a very powerful meaning. But they leave a nail outside in order for you to hang your ego before you walk into that TV. They ask you, don't, don't bring in your, your hard feelings or your negative mind to sit down as a new person in their circle to begin to talk about the subject. And I invite you to do the same thing here. I, I noticed the cedar branches outside of the, the room. They serve the same purpose. 
And I love the fact that they were stapled to the wall. Wow. <laughs> Somebody's going to have to repaint that wall, hey, Preston? <laughs> Those Indians, they'll do anything, eh? <laughs> That's the university, let's staple them. <laughs> I love that. That's great. One of the things that's changed is the fact that you come to conferences like this and we always acknowledge the traditional territory of the original and owners of the land. It is being done all over the province and I, 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 I really commend the government for that. But they're finally acknowledging the original people whose territory has been for since time out of mind. But we keep referring to these treaties as Douglas treaties, pre-Confederation. In my view, continuing the, the misdirection. Aboriginal people have been marginalized in this country to the edges of our psyche as Canadians. Like this island we've got, Vancouver Island. Captain Vancouver found us. <laughs> the Fraser River, Simon Fraser found us. This whole notion of discovery, marginalizing Aboriginal people. And I invite you at this time to keep these things in mind as you move forward today. And I hope that, that you come away from this conference, as the president said, with, with a better understanding. First contact for Aboriginal people happened on many levels, from the fur trade to the introduction of Christianity, the first time they held a bottle of whiskey to the moment that the children were taken away to schools to the first time they held someone that had smallpox and died in their arms and then they came to take the land they called it a treaty that's what I remember I'm trying to change my view. I hope that that happens for you. Thank you. people in Vancouver Island University, everyone in attendance, I wanted to present you with this gift in recognition of your attendance and, and your words today. So thank you so much, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you very I'd like to thank His Honor for reminding us not only that we must come into this room <clears throat> with open minds, but also with open hearts, and that we require both open minds and open hearts if we're going to see each other and be together in new ways. Our next opening remarks come from another leader, National Chief Sean Atlio of the Assembly of First Nations, Hereditary Chief of the Hausit First Nation, 
I think, well known in this area as well as the chancellor of this institution, the Vancouver Island University, um, and known across the country as a dynamic, visionary, and uh, very, very, very popular and um, leader who is setting new ways for all of us to build understanding with each other. So National Chief at Leo. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Wikash, Wikash Nas, Hartlepi Hut Whitley. Wikash Nas, Hartlepi Hut Whitley. Chachum Hasa, Chachum Hasa. I can't help but to offer uh, thanks and to the Creator and acknowledgement, uh, Chief Hunt, and thanking you for opening the space and uh, to our friend, CM. Chief Doug White III for your very kind and warm welcome to all of us here on behalf of your people and to see you sitting with your fellow chiefs, CM, Hawaii chiefs, Yakisu, Ahirpit, acknowledge all of you, as well as those who are elders that are amongst us here. Sit Yak Sa Inchat, Histakshit, Ahosat, Nuchonathlet. I am also known as Ah Inchat, coming from the village of Ahauzit in the west coast and count amongst many of the Coast Salish uh, family, uh, my relatives. It's, it's great to be with you at home. I was sitting on uh, the tarmac in, in Ottawa last night getting a text message from Doug. So I hope you're in Snunemo territories now, ready for the conference. And there was a great thunderstorm that came down. Actually, both the regional chief and I were caught in thunderstorms back east. We were together at our national executive meeting. And then to come here to the, to the West Coast on a day as beautiful as, as it is today. It's, um, for, for us, I think, a symbolic backdrop to the brief um, interaction the regional chief and I had about this moment, that perhaps this conversation that so many of you have honored the invitation from the, from the chiefs, particularly Chief White, to gather to talk about what it is that the ancestors have done uh, marks perhaps a day, but is part of a bigger moment. That when I look at the, uh, the, the elder leaders, you leaders who've been doing this work for so long, um, us younger guys, we, younger men and women, we thank you. We thank you for your persistence and for your resilience and for the teachings. And I want to commend President, uh, President Ralph. You know, he's a big guy, you can see. <laughs> Former football player doing an outstanding job in, in, in uh, leading this institution. And he's welcomed the nudging that has, has come with his bold outreach to invite me to be chancellor here. That institutions like this one should not only be developing human capital for a market economy, but should also be inviting the kind of dialogue that sparks the light of fire in individuals to be true agents for change become actors in a more civil society. And it, it does require the, the kind of dialogue that this has opened up. So the partnership that you, Chief, and you, President Nielsen, the two of you have embarked on, marks, I hope, um, the resurgence of what the, the collective ancestors have done. Because it's already been mentioned here, these, these treaties, they, they belong to the treaty people, the Douglas Treaty First Nations. But they were also forged with the newcomers of whom the ancestors still have settled and stayed in these territories and, and others have come to settle in, in your respective territories. And so it becomes about learning, which is the reason why it's important that a moment like this is held in a university like Vancouver Island University that would spark the, the, the kind of change that uh, my uh, fellow um, board member, Billy Yoakum and I, and council member on Snunemo, I'll count us in as the young guys in, 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 the, in the mix. Um, we look around this room at the senior leadership that, that are here amongst First Nations, commissioners, uh, chiefs, grand chiefs, former chiefs, all the way from Quebec, Grand Chief Conrad Siwi, sitting in the front, for whom I've also learned a tremendous amount coming from the Huron-Wendat, hear about the treaties um, in the East. And that is the few thoughts that I wanted to share when I think he's sitting side by side with, with Dan Smith, 
First Nation Summit uh, Task Force. And we reflect briefly on, on the, the efforts that have been underway here in British Columbia to reconcile the, the rights of, and interests of First Nations and, um, and British Columbia and Canada. And like, uh, like your honor, I have some, uh, some notes um, that I'm actually not gonna use. <laughs> They're really good notes, I just wanna assure you. Um, what I wanted to share with you was um, this notion about, uh, about learning and the fact that this, uh, this is taking place in a place like uh, Vancouver Island University. As, the, as your honor, you'd pointed out, you talked about uh, the leaders in, across the Great Plains who meet in their great teepees. And I have the privilege in this role of national chief to coming from a village like a Hauset, growing up in a family like I did with elders and parents who are seeking to help me understand why is it that we have the conditions that we do in our communities? Why is it that when we went to the city, there seemed to be such a deep disconnect between being a Hauset and New Chonolf and the kids who were in the city? Why do we have the kind of turmoil that we do? Why do we hurt one another the way that we do? I didn't understand and I was seeking answers to these questions from my family and, and I'm so thankful that I have and still have wonderful parents for whom we've been able to work through understanding the dynamic of uh, the history that has created the kind of situation. And I'm glad to see that there are both uh, citizens, community leaders, government leaders, actors in, in a, what I hope to be a more civil society gathered here and, and want to sort of bring forward just this last Monday, I was in New York at the United Nations. And um, there's your speech happening up there too. <laughs> when I was in New York, the topic at the United Nations, there was a gathering of the, the permanent form of, in, of indigenous peoples. And by the way, Grand Chief Edward John just got appointed chairperson of the permanent form at the United Nations for, for Indigenous Peoples. It's absolutely outstanding. He is the, he's the first, uh, first North American uh, appointee to the role of chair, and the regional chief and I were there. We were able to congratulate the Grand Chief. But uh, chiefs um, and elders and delegates, I wanted to reflect as, as we speak about that which um, is the topic here, the Douglas Treaties and other treaties, Grand Chief, that at the United Nations, thankfully, they're focusing in on some of the core underpinnings of this discussion, the doctrine of discovery. And I was really heartened to be in New York, gathered with indigenous peoples around the world who are looking to First Nations, to indigenous peoples, the likes of that have gathered here. And they're looking to provinces like British Columbia, provinces like Quebec, countries like Canada, to truly demonstrate leadership for indigenous peoples around the world. So this might be about the Douglas Treaties, it might be about Vancouver Island, but make no mistake what happens here in this country as it relates to the relationship between indigenous peoples and the state may mean the difference between life or death at the, at the end of a barrel of a gun over a, a major mining project in South America or continued dispossession of lands in places like Africa. The, the link here to his honor and the link to the crown and the, its history is absolutely fundamental. And in New York, uh, we were able to reflect that we now have the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Global, in, global consensus amongst Indigenous peoples and now thankfully, states like Canada and the United States endorsed the declaration recently. We also have the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. The United Nations Human Rights Council has by consensus condemned doctrines of discovery and superiority as incompatible with democracy and transparent, accountable government. That this and these doctrines have been used to dehumanize, to exploit and subjugate and dispossess peoples of lands and resources. These fictitious doctrines have been supported relentlessly in the pursuit of lands and resources by European nations. Treaties such as the Douglas Treaties, and treaty relations, what they do in a very powerful way, not just for First Nations, but those who've come to settle on your, on your territories, what they do 
is they expose the myth. They expose the myths of these underlying doctrines, the doctrine of discovery being one. They also expose the false premise, but they also point the way forward. As Dr. Leroy Little Bear said most famously at a recent, recent forum on water, he says, treaties and rights, they're not, just, they're not just rights for protection, they're rights of liberty. They are rights to free us all. The consequences of past wrongs that, have, that are apparent in the socioeconomic conditions I've been alluding to here around the world constitute breaches of natural justice. When we speak of both domestic, national, and international law, we look to scholars like Louise Mandel, a giant in the work of Aboriginal title and rights and treaty rights in, in her work, who I want to acknowledge. She's always so humble but with her colleagues has just done incredible work supporting First Nations. This is part of the long struggle that we've been under, undertaking. And I wanted to report that before we left New York, we requested that the United Nations Permanent Forum on, on Indigenous Peoples, that they undertake work to examine laws and policies and to establish plans with Indigenous Peoples to address the underpinnings, the likes of the doctrine of discovery. The idea that this was an empty land, that there was no people here, that uh, Simon Fraser found us, that uh, Captain Vancouver found us. Uh, we've always been here. We are a resilient people. We've been through a tremendous amount. We weren't, in fact, supposed to make it this far. We were supposed to be long, long gone. And so it really is cause for celebration for not only First Nations, but for our collective ancestors that today, on a day that marks major events like the anniversary of the War of 1812 when Indigenous peoples fought not as subjects but as allies, fighting shoulder to shoulder in the East, shedding their blood, losing their life for what we now call Canada. Next year marks the 250th anniversary, Your Honour. I know you would know this very well of the Royal Proclamation as it links that there have been delegations of chiefs that have made their way to visit Her Majesty to help reflect on the notion that treaties were made before Canada was even formed, that the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples confirms that Canada is a successor state and as such has an obligation to work with First Nations to make sure that the treaties are implemented in the spirit and intent with which the Indigenous Peoples understand them. This year marks the 30th anniversary of the repatriation of the Canadian Constitution, where the work that's been undertaken by our leaders for so long was effective in ensuring that Aboriginal title and rights and treaty rights were affirmed in Section 35 of the Constitution. And so we have this incredible legacy of work that we've all inherited. It feels to me like the ancestors, the collective ancestors of those who forged the Douglas Treaty are gathered with the approximate 300 people who are here today. It feels like they are helping to encourage along all of us to say it's time to return to the respectful relationship, one filled of mutual respect and recognition. One where hope beats that, ha hopes that, where we truly learn, push up against one another to forge a, a better future. It does feel like this moment here in this auditorium, here in Snunamu Territories, here at this institution, it marks a very, very significant moment in our history. One that is part of a larger moment where we can say, down the road, generations from, from now, those at that time in 2012 understood what was needed to be done and they got about doing the hard work because there is no easy way forward. The Dif difficult work of reconciliation requires us to engage in those difficult discussions. This is the work of, of relationship building. But there is an easier path in the future if we choose to do the hard work now. So that that young one who is gurgling his or her speech at the top will inherit a world that the path has been laid out in a much better way than which we've inherited it here today. And so I feel particularly inspired and invigorated by being here with all of you. Thank you for the opportunity to share a few thoughts. Thank you to the leadership for, for what you're doing to bring us all together. Haichka, tleko, tleko, kilakasla. Thank you, National Chief. And I want to highlight Two, two themes that he wove together beautifully in his words. The first, the process of over, overcoming the illusions, the myths, the fallacies on which much of the structures and patterns of behavior that we see today remain founded. 
but then also situating us in a much larger context. The challenges we are here to discuss are not local only, are not provincial or regional only. They're national and they're global. And I just wanted to highlight that tomorrow it will have Grand Chief Conrad Siwi lead us through some of that discussion, as well as Chief Wil Wilton Littlechild, who will join us and help give some of those broader perspectives and help situate what is happening here in the global context which it's indivisible from. So thank you, National Chief. Um, our next opening remarks come from Regional Chief Jody Wilson-Raybould. Uh, Jody is a, a, a lawyer, a, a, a leader, a former member of the BC Treaty Commission. She's of the Kwakwakawak people and uh, lives on Cape Mudge on Quadra Island. And I'd like to welcome Regional Chief Jody wilson Waybold. on my, uh, my brother up there to cheer for me. <laughs> Good morning. I, I, uh, I'm really happy to be here and I wanted to uh, first of course uh, acknowledge the traditional territory of the Slanemach people and acknowledge the beautiful day that uh, Chief you've brought to us and, and your community. Thank you Chief White. And uh, to thank uh, our elder um, my elder in chief Hunt for the prayer and uh, the welcome as well. I, um, as I said, I'm really, I'm really pleased to be here and uh, pleased to follow uh, the distinguished gentleman that uh, uh, provided some words before me and uh, wanted to uh, acknowledge and recognize uh, his honor, Stephen Point, for, uh, for your words um, uh, today, but most importantly for your contribution to our your years of contribution to our people and uh, to our province and, and to our country. Thank you for that. I know that your, your term is coming to a close, but the contributions that you've made, not only as Lieutenant Governor, but uh, as a leader in, in your community and in our communities is, I think, one that's recognized by all of us. So, Gela Kasla. And uh, to, uh, to President uh, Ralph, Dr. Ralph, thank you for once again having us uh, here in uh, beautiful um, Vancouver Island University and uh, thank you to again to Chief White uh, for the partnership that the two of you have formed in terms of, uh, of starting this uh, or continuing this really important conversation in this beautiful uh, learning institution. I thank you and I'm honored to be able to present here. Uh, my name is uh, Puglas. I, uh, my other name is Jody Wilson-Raybould, and I come from the Muskimad, Zawadanik, and Lihuikta people of northern Vancouver Island. And uh, I have uh, the fortune of living on this beautiful island as well, and just uh, about an hour and a half north of here on Quadra Island, where I uh, live in my home community, and um, I'm fortunate and sometimes um, unfortunate to serve as a member of council for the Waiwakai Nation. And uh, I am also fortunate to, to uh, have been elected by the 203 uh, First Nations Chiefs uh, of British Columbia to serve as the regional chief. And for that, I am uh, very honored and, and grateful and wanted to recognize those chiefs that are here, in particular the, the chiefs of the Douglas uh, um, Treaty First Nations and uh, acknowledge all of the important work that you do. And uh, I, unlike my uh, previous, uh, or my uh, colleagues, um, have some notes, and uh, um, I'm gonna refer to them. And uh, as a learning institution, I've, I've uh, had the fortune of, of going to two post-secondary education, educational institutes, and uh, um, love when there are questions posed in terms of, uh, in conferences and in classrooms that uh, um, raise questions and raise, uh, um, concerns and, and most importantly raise opportunities that we can collectively uh, collectively harness. So um, um, your honor mentioned um, or asked the question why we're here and um, that's why that's why I'm here. Um, I'm here to, to learn. I'm here to provide some of the thoughts that I have with respect to the place that our, our people are at, indigenous people are at within this country. And uh, I always say when I open up in terms of my comments I I, as the regional chief and as a citizen in my own nation, I truly believe our nations are in a profound period of transition, a profound period of change. 
We're rebuilding our nations and moving beyond our colonial past. Most of our nations across Canada are going through this period of change, starting from the platform of a pre-existing treaty with the Crown. Some pre-Confederation, some historical, the numbered treaties. And here on Vancouver Island, of course, the Douglas Treaties, the subject of the conference. Of course, in this province, with the exception of your Douglas Treaties and Treaty 8, most of us do not have treaties. However, we have, however, whether we have a treaty or not, all of us have a similar relationship with the Crown and are going through the same process of decolonization. We all share a common history of paternalistic governance by Canada under the Indian Act. In BC, we face some, the same challenges on reserve and face the same issues off reserve as those nations with historical treaties in other provinces. Off reserve, in the days before Dalgamuk, Haida, and Taku, and other title and rights cases, it used to be, I think it's fair to say, perhaps easier or more advantageous to rely on a treaty to advocate your rights, notwithstanding the differences and in interpretations of the treaty, than relying on arguments of unextinguished Aboriginal title. Today, one might argue that that is no longer the case. Take Enbridge, for example. It is going to be easier, or is it going to be easier or harder for them and the Crown to try and push through Northern Gateway Pipeline in the treaty areas or in areas of unextinguished title in the face of First Nations opposition? Does it make a difference? I think the company and Canada both believe it will be tougher in British Columbia than in Alberta because here the lands are unceded Aboriginal title lands. To be honest though, it shouldn't really matter. It should be equally tough. All our nations, with pre-existing treaties or not, are looking to build a new future within Canada based on recognition and reconciliation. To implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and by going through the difficult process of healing, rebuilding our governments and taking back control of our lives and our lands. In British Columbia, Many of us thought that this process was going to take place through the modern BC treaty making process. And as a former commissioner, under my friend and then Chief Commissioner Stephen Point, I think we all thought that the BC treaty making process would provide the answers and find the solutions for nations in British Columbia, including for some of those with Douglas treaties. It is telling, though, that our friends in the Treaty 8 area decided some time ago to adhere to their numbered treaty rather than negotiate a modern treaty and are looking for governance solutions in different places. The BC treaty making process, of course with some exceptions, is unfortunately not providing all that much success. And today that process grinds along and has an uncertain future. I believe we need new ideas. One observation from our experiences in implementing Aboriginal title and rights, including treaty rights, is that it is no longer necessary to enter into a formal or modern written treaty to benefit from and enjoy our rights and title and to define our new and evolving relationship with the Crown. In fact, what appears to be occurring in practice is the development of what we might call unwritten treaties between our nations and the Crown based on convention, laws, the evolving common law, and various protocols, memorandums, and other agreements our nations are entering into with the Crown. This combined with the simple exercise of our rights and title on the ground in accordance to our internationally and domestically recognized rights is creating a new reality. The reality of what one might call, or what I call, the unwritten treaty, and what appears to be the direction in which we are heading. Whether you have a pre-existing treaty or not, 
that deals with aspects of the relationship with the crown, the fundamental question each of our nations is asking are basically the same. How do we govern ourselves in a post-Indian Act world? How do we get access, fair access, to our lands and resources, and at the same time, deal with the social problems our peoples are facing as we heal, heal and rebuild? For those First Nations in British Columbia with historical treaties, the Douglas Treaties, how can, how can those documents be used strategically to ensure access to lands and resources and to implement governance reform? How do they help your nations in this period, this amazing period of rebuilding? Where do they fit in? As is being discussed this week, as the National Chief indicated, in New York at the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, what state legislation, in our case, federal or provincial legislation may be necessary to ensure fair access to lands and resources and to ensure that the governing bodies of our nations are both legitimate in the eyes of our peoples and also recognized by the Crown. Where Canada, at the very least, pulls back from on reserve and vacates its governance role, and where off reserve we have clear roles in shared decision making and have access to our resources and lands that in the case of the pre-existing treaties has already been promised. In the case of your Douglas treaties, already recognized and what should be very significant hunting and fishing rights and the rights to all traditional village sites. It is all, I strongly believe, about having a clear vision of our future and then using the tools, if I can call them that, available, including your pre-existing treaties, to attain the vision. Where that vision ca cannot be met under the terms of the status quo and where additional and new legal mechanisms will, be, will need to be developed, either by going to court or negotiating with the Crown. The collective visions of our nations is key, but where the strategic and the plan of getting to that vision may be different depending on whether or not your nation has a pre-existing treaty. In the future, who knows? Maybe we'll have an even stronger, court even stronger court decisions on treaty rights based on our interpretations of what our treaties, your treaties meant and mean. Perhaps reading down the surrender language and strengthening the continued use of land resource provisions. Maybe we are moving, as mentioned, to the place where there is a treaty-like relationship, as we understand that relationship to mean, but, bi but built not on a single or limited treaty document, but based on a number of sources, where a pre-existing treaty may be one document that speaks to that relationship, along with other political and legal conventions or arrangements or agreements, that speak in their, total, or in their totality, speak to and set the First Nations Crown relationship, the unwritten or uncodified treaty, where no single document delineates our special relationship with the Crown. This will probably be the reality here in British Columbia, as it appears most of our nations will no longer be looking to negotiate a comprehensive treaty but will rather have a series of governance or land-related agreements with the Crown, such as self-government agreements, reconciliation agreements, or benefits agreements that are entered into from time to time. There may also be more general protocols or memorandums with the Crown, and still many more agreements amongst ourselves to resolve and define shared use areas. I'm saying all this because each and every one of us each nation, as we set our own course for our own future and go forth and make it happen, will be using all the legal and political tools we have developed and still are developing. We will come together and share our resources and to support one another and develop mechanisms with the Crown to achieve reconciliation. At the end of the day, the primary responsibility for implementing, as we know, the right of self-determination and securing access to lands and resources rests squarely on the shoulders of each of our nations. This is, as I like to stress, all about nation building, nation rebuilding, 
which is why this conversation that we're having here today is so fundamentally important, whether we have a treaty or not. How can we, as First Nations people, support one another? So our citizens can enjoy their rights, including treaty rights, without molestation and confident in the knowledge that their governments are empowered and capable of looking after their interests. And I, like you, am so very proud to be part of this movement, to be part of this amazing time, this period of change that the National Chief indicates, this turning point. I'm really pleased, Chief White, to be here and listen to the experts in the room to share in conversation and to build a common future. Gaila Kasla, thank you for having me. Drawing out what is a very ironic and quite troubling question, which is how can it be that nations in treaties, treaties which are by their nature acts of recognition and reconciliation, find themselves in the same situation as those who do not have treaties. It is a very troubling reality in the history of this country that we have to explore how that can be in this day and age. So thank you, we'll, we'll be exploring that further as we, we move along. Our last opening remarks come from Chief Douglas White, who's well known to all of you, the chief of the Sinemo First Nation, a member of the political executive, uh, along with Grand Chief Ed John and Dan Smith of the First Nation Summit, um, himself a lawyer and himself a scholar of the pre-Confederation treaties. Chief White. Thank you. Uh, once again, I want to um, I'll just thank everyone for being here. It's a, it's a great honor to have everyone gathered up in this way at this conference. I want to give recognition and respect and great thanks to Chief George Hunt Sr. for your opening prayer and getting us started in such a strong way and for all of the wonderful remarks. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge the, the really interesting symmetry of the, the Lieutenant Governor standing here and saying, I've got a blank piece of paper. Uh, the last time that happened was about 150 years ago or so in, uh, here in our territory when a blank piece of paper was put in front of my ancestors. And uh, no, it's, you know, the, this conference, um, I have a, a, a few uh, notes myself. I wanted to uh, say that the conference is born of a few simple ideas. Uh, in the time that I've been chief for the last couple of years, it's become clear to me how interconnected our lives are. Our lives are interconnected, everyone that lives in Stanemo territory. And we matter to each other. We have things to talk about and consider together. And we need to take those basic truths about our situation that we're in that we're interconnected, that we matter to each other. We need to take those basic truths as the foundation of and a starting point as we build our future lives together. The, um, you know, much of my time uh, in, the, in the first couple of years of being chief of Stanemo, uh, there's been a, a lot of a, a sort of a shock for me to come to the realizations of the lack of the implementation and respect for the treaty relationship that we're in with everyone. And I, you know, the, I, I just wanted to say a few quick things about um, why it's so shocking, and then talk about where I, where I hope that we go from this point forward, using the conversations that I hope emerge from this conference as starting points for a different direction. When I was, uh, you know, growing up as a, as a young Stanemo boy, um, the, the living in a treaty was a, a daily event, a daily occurrence. Going out fishing with my grandfather, going out hunting with my uncles was a normal course of events. On those hunting trips, out on the waters of Stanemo territory, fishing with my grandfather, uh, there's always interspersed discussion and talk about the history of our peoples, about the white and bob litigation from the 1960s, and about uh, the recognition of Stanemo fishing rights, Stanemo hunting rights. That's how I lived and grew up. I never did encounter or, or come across fisheries officers or conservation officers haranguing uh, me and my grandfather when we're out uh, being Stanemo, engaging in creation. 
showing respect to the, um, our relations, the salmon and, and the deer. Um, I grew up knowing about the remarkable white and bob litigation. My grandfather, late grandfather, Chief Doug White, the first was the chief at the time in the 60s um, <clears throat> when, it was, and this is a story I've told numerous times over the last couple of years, and it's a story that's, uh, that's based in conflict. It's based on misunderstanding. It's based on a, a lack of recognition and respect. Because in July 7th, 1963, Clifford White and David Bob were, were hunting. Um, they, they had uh, Jerry Thomas and Leonard White, two young boys at the time, out hunting with them. Uh, they, they shot six deer um, to feed themselves and their families and their community. The conservation officer, a fellow of Nanaimo, um, Franklin Greenfield, uh, stopped them on the road and arrested them, charged them for hunting deer out of season. And the next day, this is, uh, so this is 1963, the next day a remarkable thing happened. Clifford White stood up in front of the magistrate in the court in, down here in Nanaimo and he did something remarkable. He stood up and he put forward a very clear conception and a very different conception of law and history about this part of the world and about the nature of the relationship between the Snanemo people and the Crown. And he said to the magistrate, my answer to these charges is that we have a treaty relationship between us. We have a treaty of peace and friendship, he called it, that recognizes our right to continue to hunt in the way we were hunting, that recognizes our ability to hunt in accordance with Snanemo law. And in 1963, you know, everyone here I think understands that was a pretty remarkable thing to do. It was both very simple to stand up in that way and yet it took enormous courage and it was very profound that he did that. The, uh, the response that he got from the magistrate and from the, the Crown prosecutor was that this, uh, you know, this is outrageous, this is not, um, I think the judge expressed some judicial frustration at being faced with this different idea about law and history. And, and um, he said uh, to Clifford when he convicted him, he said, Clifford, I want you to know, he says, I, it's pure piggishness on your part to be talking about this alleged treaty in my courtroom. He called him, you know, piggish, greedy, a pig. The position of the Crown Prosecutor was that there is no such thing as a treaty between the Snanemoch and the Crown. And so they were convicted and went on their way and it's a, it's a remarkable, amazing story in history. Just the White and Bob litigation itself of, of what came together. Because what came together was in, in many ways similar to what we have here today. What came together was uh, you know, a remarkable woman named Maisie Hurley who was the editor of the, uh, the Native Voice, the paper of the, the Native Brotherhood of British Columbia, brought in, you know, she connected the Snanemo people with Tom Berger, who was then a young lawyer at her husband's uh, law practice. Her, her husband was a, a criminal defense lawyer in Vancouver, and uh, Tom was uh, then a very young man. Brought in Tom Berger, um, the Snanemo people stood up in support of the appeal. Our relations on Vancouver Island stood up in support of the appeal. Guy Williams from the Native Brotherhood, Frank Calder from the Nishka, um, people from the broader community all came together to, uh, to start to talk about and really um, think about what are these treaties all about and what do they mean to us today? And it took everyone. It took, uh, it, it, was, it was by no means a Snanemo initiative. This was an initiative of the people of Vancouver Island working together, all of the chiefs that are sitting here all of their nations working together um, to achieve the, uh, the White and Bob litigation victory. So 1965 rolls around. The Supreme Court of Canada confirms the Court of Appeal decision from 64 that, that said a couple of important things. First, there is in fact a treaty relationship. There is a treaty between the Snanemo and the Crown. Second, it has to mean something today. It will be implemented in our time. And what it means is that uh, the provincial government does not have jurisdiction to interfere with the operation of the treaty rights, the continuance of the treaty rights. So that's a pretty, I mean, that, and that's a statement. 
the remarkable litigation. So the, the, in the first argument, line of argument, there was this document is a treaty. And, and the alternative argument was if the court doesn't agree that this is a treaty, then we're going to be talking about and standing here talking about our Aboriginal title and rights in the alternative. And so all of the substance of what we've been dealing with in the 50 years since, half a century of fighting in the courts was, was sort of put, it was basically put forward in the White and Bob litigation. It's a, an amazing story. And so knowing that history, knowing that story, knowing the remarkable things that were done, um, showing up as chief in 2009 and recognizing, being shocked by the reality that there's 50 years of Supreme Court of Canada jurisprudence from White and Bob to Morris and Olson that's reflected in decisions across the country, not just in relation to Douglas treaties, but treaties all across the country. Grand Chief Conrad Sewey and, and his people building upon that jurisprudence in such important ways, using it, applying it, developing it. Um, the recent Kiwatan decision in Ontario in the fall has some of its roots in Douglas Treaty jurisprudence. Knowing the significance of all of that and, and the history of all of that from my perspective, I have to admit I was utterly and completely shocked at the way the Stanemo people in 2010 and 2011 were being regarded, the lack of respect and recognition for all of that history. And so there's a lot of conflict in the past. There's a lot of disrespect in the past. Um, what this conference is about is about uh, trying to build a different kind of level of understanding and recognition forged through respectful engagement and conversation with each other to talk about these important issues that matter to us. I don't want to have to, to, to fight about these things. It's, you know, the, the, so much of the jurisprudence is forged. It's, first of all, it's all deeply adversarial. Um, secondly, it's all based on statutory charges for the most part. Someone being charged and someone having to be defended. In my work as the Sinanemo chief for the last two years, there's been a number of important disputes in the local region. Um, I don't want to have to fight to create the world that the national chief talked about for the young, young boy up there and my, my two young babies at home, all of our children. I don't think that's the, so this conference is born out of that desire and that wish to sit together and talk, engage in a respectful, meaningful way, recognize each other, talk about the important issues between us. Um, this is the, you know, the, the treaties of our peoples that are sitting here in the crown, they are constitutional documents. They are an important part of the Constitution of Canada. They contain very important and strong legal rights. Um, it's incumbent upon all of us, and, and certainly my mandate from my community is to stand up and to protect and defend my people, to give them the space and the opportunity to have a good life. That requires me to work with everyone in this room, to stand up and, and recognize everyone that's here, to recognize the people that are here that we're in dispute with and have been in the past, but that we've worked through that and, and forged partnership and relationships. And so I'm really hopeful you know, this is one, two days of our lives where we have an opportunity to talk about these important things. And I know that it's only two days, it's only a start, but I think it's a very important, different way of engaging. And um, I'm really thankful that everybody's here, and I really am grateful for the fact of the participation from across the country, Grand Chief Conrad Siwi being with us. It's such an honor. Chief Wilton Littlechild coming tomorrow uh, Tom Berger tonight. Um, it's just a, it's a wonderful, uh, remarkable opportunity for us to benefit from all of the, the leadership that has been um, working for so many years to bring us to this spot in time where we're at today. I want to be clear about the, um, about the nature of these treaties. 
that uh, when I stand up and speak, I'm only speaking for this, the name of people. That there's 14 different treaties that were entered into in, th in the 1850s on Vancouver Island. Each of those treaties is unique and distinct, and I don't speak for any of them other than Snenemo. Each of these chiefs that are here have a unique and individual oral history and story and, and, and treaty relationship with the Crown. They are the ones that speak, including, I believe, Chief Andy Thomas sitting there in the front. I recognize you, sir. Each of these people are the leaders of, of their nations and working um, diligently for years and years to... Uh, to advance and, and protect their people and their interests and their rights. And I wanted to conclude my opening remarks by just giving recognition and respect to them. Um, I really honor their participation that you're here and, uh, and, and respect you and, and love your nations and your people. So with that, uh, Roshan, Roshan told me yesterday that um, out of all of the people providing opening remarks, the only person he would hook off the stage was me. <laughs> he hasn't done that. <laughs> and I'm grateful to that, but I do just want to finish there and, and thank you, thank everyone that's uh, provided opening remarks so far, and really uh, I look forward to the today and tomorrow. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Chief White, and again to all of our opening speakers who I think really have, have laid out so clearly the, the kinds of cons conversations, the kind of exploration, the kind of soul, soul searching we want to see take place over the next few days, and, and the nature of the challenges, these very intractable challenges that we need to address in these very, as was said by all of the speakers, very dynamic and changing times. And I'd like once again to thank all of our opening speakers and welcome everyone. And I hope you enjoy the two days. And if I could again, please ask, ladies and gentlemen, everyone to rise for his honor, the Lieutenant Governor of British Columbia. <laughs>